Good morning guys, I'm Natasha. This is Shepherding Pepper's Farm and welcome back to the garden. It is time for another weekly garden tour. It is a little muggy and a little humid. We are expecting a rainstorm today, possibly some thunder and lightning, so I figured I'd bring you guys out before the thunderstorm hits because I have food that I need to harvest and it's always fun to bring you guys with me. So let's take a look at this garden and see what we have going on this week. I think I'm gonna start you guys out in this back row right here where we have our peppers. As you can see, we are starting to get loads and loads of fruit back here, which is really exciting. These right here, these are cayennes. We have several of these plants in here. These are serranos. You can tell because they have this rounded tip to them. We harvested a few of these peppers just the other day. Typically, you wanna let your cayennes get nice and red and right before you make hot sauce with them, but we will sometimes chop them up and put them on things fresh as they are. These are baby poblanos right here. Now over here, we have some spicy banana peppers in the back. We have more serranos. And then back here in the back, you can kind of, can't really see it, it's underneath this. This little guy, and this little guy right here, this is our first habanero of the year. So all these peppers coming in is actually really exciting. I do start to pick our peppers at this stage. Well, the plants are still moderately sized when the fruits are green. Now the majority of these hot peppers I'm gonna want to let ripen over the course of several weeks. I want those really beautiful red spicy hot peppers. The more you let your peppers ripen the sweeter they get but if they're hot they also get hotter as you let them ripen. So things like our cayennes I'm gonna want those to be nice and red before I'm gonna make hot sauce with them. Things of that nature. Serranos are typically eaten green. They're kind of the exception to that rule. Jalapenos as well are typically eaten green. They're actually considered chipotle peppers when they are turned red and then smoked. Um, but we like to have spicy peppers on hand for meals and for cooking. And so I'm gonna harvest a good chunk of these today. I'm gonna keep them separate from the sweet peppers that we're gonna harvest up in the front. But frequently harvesting your peppers is going to send signals to your plant to produce you more fruit. So don't ever feel bad about harvesting your fruit while it's still green if you're wanting your plant to grow you more food. So serrano peppers are typically harvested when they're around this size. They're only a few inches long, they're not red at all. And then cayennes are the opposite. You want them to get really nice and big and red when you harvest them. You can, however, harvest green cayenne peppers and enjoy a good bit of heat and home that isn't as killer as the red ones. All right, y'all. You wanna see something really sad? I knew it was coming. I was prepared for it. I've seen the damage. The plant did a really good job trying to ripen the fruit. As you can see, this spaghetti squash right here is really nicely colored. We can take this. This backside right here that isn't fully ripe, this will ripen on the counter. Just twist that off. My little harvesting basket is no longer going to cut it. There's a huge spaghetti squash. And then there are several little baby spaghetti squashes over here. We're gonna take these as well. So the death of a squash is never a pleasant thing. We get vine borers really, really bad here. It's something that we try to combat every year. There are methods to deal with them. Most of them are non-organic, and since we try to grow our food as organically as possible, I say organically as possible because we do occasionally have to lay stuff down for ants because we get really, really bad fire ants out here, and there's nothing worse than having a screaming child furiously upset because they're covered in ant bites, so I'm not doing that. Still, there are some pretty good organic ant things like borax and stuff, but. I'm really not that worried about it. We just grow food for our family. So anyways, since we don't spray anything or put anything like seven dust on our plants that would combat the vine borers in a more aggressive way. The way that I deal with vine borers and pests and things of that nature is I plant more than I need. I know that I am not going to need 27 spaghetti squashes throughout the year. We grow a bunch of other squash. We grow a bunch of other fruits and vegetables. It's nice to have squash occasionally with dinner throughout you know the year and it's nice to have some on hand but I plant more than I need knowing that part of it I will get to enjoy my family will get to enjoy and part of it the bugs are going to enjoy and so that way after I've harvested 10 squashes off of this plant and the bugs finally have their way with it it's not the end of the world because I still got 10 squashes and there's much more squash to be had we're going to plant another round of spaghetti squash we're going to do some more succession sowing which is where you do more seeds and more plants kind of continually throughout the growing season so that way you have a prolonged harvest so yeah, does this kind of stink? Yeah, it does. It's a bummer because the plant was doing well and it was producing, but I got what I needed food-wise and now the bugs can destroy the rest of it. 
Let's take a look at the berries though, at the end of this plant. All right, I have to say it. I was a little skeptical of the Schwarzenbeeren berry. I was a little skeptical because I don't really know many plants that ripen in a single growing season, produce bushels and bushels of fruit, and will come back year after year even if the plant dries, dies back. And yet, here we are. So this berry right here is actually not one that I'm going to eat because it is not fully black. These ones right here are fine because they are fully black and they're a matte color, they're not shiny. This berry, which is called a garden huckleberry, is edible when it is fully ripe. Most people still will cook the berries. They'll make jellies and jams and pies and things of like that out of the fruit instead of just eating it raw. There's a leaf-footed bug. I'm gonna show you and then I'm gonna squish this bug really quickly. Hold on. This is a leaf-footed bug. They quite literally suck the life out of your plants. I'm so tired of these things. Year after year, those pests irritate me almost more than the vine mowers do because they multiply in droves and then they literally are just, they're awful. Anyhow, back to the Schwarzenbeeren berry. I have never tasted these. I do this a lot in this garden. I grow things that I love, that I've tried, that I know are excellent, and then I grow things that I've never tried before. So we're gonna go through this together. Huh. I'm dying. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, flavor impressions. I'm a terrible actress, number one. <laughs> but flavor impressions, it's not bad. It reminds me a lot of a tomato because there is a lot of seeds and it has that jelly texture that tomatoes have over their seeds. But it's got this very mild, gentle sweetness that's very similar to a blueberry. This is actually really good. So I'm gonna go ahead and give the Schwarzenbeeren berry an 8.5 out of 10, at least so far. But this thing is so loaded down with fruit that we should have bushels and bushels of fruit in no time. I did hear, I do like to read a lot of reviews online and people are saying that they're kind of a pain in the butt to harvest because they grow fairly low to the ground. Like this doesn't get super tall if it's in the ground, which is why I put it at the back of the garden in a raised garden bed so it gives it some more height so it'll be easier for me to harvest it. So, but yay. All right. I guess I'm a little chatty this morning. All right, over here we have some of our beefsteak tomatoes and we have some lettuce leaf basil. This is just really beautiful and curly, I really like this. Over here we have an orange accordion that is starting to ripen. Isn't that pretty with all of the ribbing that it has on there? I'm gonna go ahead and take these orangey green fruits. And then underneath the section of plants, we have some Thai basil. Thai basil is a little bit on the spicy side. Um, it's a very strong basil flavor. It's really, really good though. Now in here you can see we have more orange accordions and then um, definitely have several romas. Now over here we have some Genovese basil. And then this right here, and this right here is our spicy globe basil. So several different varieties of basil that is in through here. This is a nice orange accordion right here because you can see it's a little bit bigger. So I like that. Now we come around. It's a really lovely orange zinnia. You can see our Fresno chilies are growing. They're doing quite well. Really happy about that. We have another little batch of serranos in through here and then some mystery hot peppers that I'm not sure what those are. Again, I see some more orange fruits. And this is why. We're gonna chat about this for a second. I mentioned this before, and I'm gonna mention it again, mostly because more people watch the garden tours than they do the little sort of uh, side videos that we do from around the farm. And I wanna make this point very well known. It is okay to harvest your tomatoes when they are blushing and turning colors. I've heard a lot of gardener shaming going on recently where people are giving each other grief over harvesting their tomatoes before they're fully red. To me, that's just the craziest thing in the world. 
because if you live in an area where you're gonna have heavy pest pressure that's going to attack your fruit, that's going to damage it, that makes it unedible for you, why would you not be okay with the idea of picking your fruit when it's blushed, setting it on the counter for a day, and then having a beautiful ripe tomato? It doesn't make any sense. So don't feel bad if you have to harvest your fruit when it has just started to blush. It is okay. You're still going to get an amazing tomato. It's gonna to taste way better than anything you get in the grocery store, and it's going to be fresher and more flavorful and juicy. So don't feel bad about it, and don't let anybody else make you feel bad about it. If you have the ability to leave your tomatoes on the vine as long as possible to let them turn red, by all means do it. You're gonna get an awesome tomato that way. But if you need to pick your fruit early so you can enjoy it, do it. And don't let anybody make you feel bad about it. All right, if we continue into this next bed, right up here in the front we have some more royal golden watermelons. These have kind of started to take off a little bit this week. You'll notice that the plants are a lot bigger as we get up there. Again, we have more blushing fruit. So in through here we have black beauty tomatoes, we have beefsteak tomatoes, we have little cherry saladette tomatoes, we have all sorts of different tomatoes and if I come across a label that tells you specifically what it is I will let you know. This is a smaller ox heart right here, I've had some massive ones though. At the base of these same tomatoes we have some more watermelons, these are lemon drop watermelons. And then if we come down a little bit farther we have some banana melons that are planted in throughout here. These are our um, black strawberry tomatoes. This is another ox heart. This right here is a marlobe tomato. So we've got some marigolds up in the front. These are different marigolds than your traditional ones. Those are Kilimanjaro white marigolds. They're really, really, really pretty. I don't love the other marigolds very much, so I'm hoping that I'll be more of a fan of these ones. Look at this ox heart tomato, okay. It started to blush, so I'm gonna take it. Man, I wish I could leave it on the vine. I can't. We have, look at this ox heart tomato. Can you see this? It has the slightest bit of blushing. It's still very green. I'm going to take it anyways. It'll ripen on the counter. I don't want anything to happen to this because it's huge, and I'm pretty sure this tomato is telling me that it loves me. Well, look at that. Isn't that just the cutest thing ever? It's like in a heart shape. I love it. It's so cool. Lots of different tomatoes that are in here. Over here, these are pretty interesting. These are our tiny spoon tomatoes. The kids have really enjoyed these quite a bit. Now if we work our way down, the red picante squash is amazing. This is exceptional. I mean, check this out. I'm gonna go over to the back side. Typically I like to go in rows with these garden toys, but oh my goodness, this is not amazing. Look at these fruits. Those are fantastic. So red picante squash is a awesome substitute for zucchini. The fruits get really big. So far, these plants have held up to the pest pressure more than any of my other squash. I mean, the exception is the Kakuzi squash, but that's technically a gourd, so. Um, not only have they been really, really beautiful and healthy and productive, they've filled out these trellises super, super well, and I love a beautiful arch trellis, so. we got a few more cherry tomatoes that are coming in through here. Our calendula is doing awesome. I still really do actually need to move this. I just haven't gotten around to it quite yet. But romas and other tomatoes that are coming in here, they look really, really good. Up and through this next bed on this first trellis, we do have blue lake pole beans that are growing. And a zinnia up in the front. These teeny tiny little plants right here, these are yellow scallop squashes. They're producing possibly the world's tiniest fruits because these plants are very unhappy. I'm just gonna be very honest about that. These are not happy campers, and it's because there has been a slew of squash bugs in this bed. I mean, a preposterous amount of them. However, the plants do seem to be holding on still. This is a gray zucchini, as is this, and this. And even if we get, I don't know, one zucchini or two zucchinis off of these plants, I will be happy with that. This is our green tent scallop squash over here. And then right here, this is a Rondoniche zucchini. 
You can see it's starting to turn yellow because I am letting this go to seed on purpose. The reason I'm letting this go to seed is because we have been producing buckets and buckets of round zucchinis. You've seen that in the other garden tours. We've had really massive fruits. The Ron Niche round zucchini is actually a specialty variety from Baker Creek. and I don't have any other seeds. Although the plant hasn't done super well, I would like to be able to save the seeds for the plant and try again in our next planting cycle coming up here in a few weeks. So that's what we're doing. We're gonna let it go to seed Hopefully it grows better next time. I can't blame it on the variety because there has been a lot of really bad pest pressure here, but I am purposely letting this stuff ripen. We work our way down. You can see that our Maypop is starting to attach itself to this trellis and climb up. I'm happy about that. I want it to do that. Maypop is definitely taking over this whole bed. Over on this arch trellis, our Armenian Yardlon cucumbers are doing really well. You can see they are producing fruits. This is about the size that I let these get to when I'm harvesting these as cucumbers. I was about to walk these back to the basket and I saw these little spoon tomatoes. These will actually get completely red when the kids want them as soon as they possibly can. <laughs> these cucumbers are doing great. These are bait alpha cucumbers year after year. These ones just do awesome. Love these. These tomatoes are doing so good this year. I'm so pleased with them. In spite of the fact that we're having to harvest them a little bit early, the quantity of tomato that is being produced is really, really, really good. Black strawberries. These have been really solid little producers. I've been harvesting several actual ripe fruits off of these. This is how they look when they're ripe. So that's pretty cool. If you're seeing this on your tomatoes, these round little lines. Those are actually tomato stretch marks. That happens when your tomato has gotten a lot of water. All of a sudden, if you have a thunderstorm, if you leave that hose running a little bit too long, don't be surprised if you see stretch marks on your tomatoes. It doesn't do anything. It's not a bad thing. It's not gonna cost you the tomato. That's just all it is. These beans right here in the front, these are royal burgundy bush beans. It's pretty easy to see where they get their name from. They are a stringless variety of bean, which is great. And I can safely say they've been producing really, really well. So I actually have a lot more beans to harvest and I'm gonna wear myself out for the rest of the garden tour if I don't do that more at the end. So we are going to continue with this garden tour now. All right, so I'm pretty sure these are the har har melons, but you know, don't quote me on that since my labels are gone. This is celery. This is, I think it's uh, Utah celery. Not totally sure. These are our Charentese melons starting to work their way up the trellis, which is really exciting. And then down here we have some of our Kajari melons starting to finally take off. And then these are our tiger melons over in through here. These right here are dragon tongue bush beans. This right here is borage. You can see the bees absolutely love the borage. Love it. So I have a tendency to plant these peppers in blocks. So this first section right here, these are Legia sweet peppers. They have kind of a heart shape on them. These will turn to a really, really beautiful red color. Um, and obviously we have some really great fruit in the back over there. And we have some Wonder Bell peppers in this section right through here. And if we work our way down, these are the Cubanelle peppers. You can see they're a much lighter green color. They do ripen to a red and orange. These are all sweet peppers in through here. More bells right through here. And then we have some baby bells. You can see these. These are little baby bells that'll ripen into an orange and red color. These are from store-bought grocery store pepper seeds. We saved. Now over here, I have a ton of peppers. I need to come through and separate these. I have not done that yet. I need to find time to do that later today, ideally. If it doesn't storm too bad, or maybe tomorrow. But these are gonna get separated. Another little batch of Wonder Bells over here. This is a really beautiful beef steak right there. Now right through here we have some Punanera cucumbers. And these get to about this size. This is essentially what you're looking for from a Punanera cucumber. You can harvest them smaller and they taste just as good. So if you're wanting to make smaller pickles out of these, don't be afraid to harvest them while they're much tinier. These right here are double click Rose Cosmos. These are our Tokyo Greens in here. These will get a little bit bigger than this if you let them. That's a pretty good one. 
because all it takes is, you know, another day and then these get really, really, really massive. All right, over and through here, we have our cinnamon basil. This is trying to go to flower. I'm not concerned with that. It'll just be beautiful and fragrant and I'll just keep harvesting on the ones that haven't bolted yet. I might harvest some of this in a minute anyways. And then we have some sweet basil. Oh my goodness, that smells good. Basil smells so amazing. I love the way it smells. We made basil lemonade the other day. Whew, so good. So, 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 so good. If you haven't made basil lemonade, it's just phenomenal. And you wouldn't think so. At least I didn't think it would be really the first time I ever did it because basil has such a pizza pesto flavor to me at least that I was like, mm, I'm not sure I want pizza lemonade. It was really, really good. Not pizza at all. All right, over here, you can see the Blau Hilled beans. This is a whole bean right here. This is not stringless. This is the one exception to my stringless bean rule in the garden. Now over and through here, we have some Pippin's Golden Honey Peppers. All right, I figured out what these are. <laughs> I figured out what these monster peppers are. It's been discovered. You've been watching over the last few weeks. You know that I don't like planting my hot peppers with my sweet peppers. But we had a pepper mix-up and these hot peppers, you can tell they're hot because they point up to the sun, got planted in the sweet pepper section. And at first I was like, I don't know what they are. I'm, I'm not really sure because I really depend on labels since we have such a big garden. When it comes to the peppers, I'm pretty good. I can tell you what the majority of things are. For example, it took me a couple of weeks of letting these get to their mature size and I was like, oh, I know exactly what this is. This is a Hungarian hot wax pepper. However, we did decide not to move them because at this point, they're probably already cross-pollinated if they're going to. Hopefully, it's not too bad. If they are cross-pollinated at all, it is what it is. I can't do much about it now, but we're just gonna put a little sign or a, a cage or a net around these peppers and tell the kids, hey, these are ones that you don't eat. These are spicy. Don't eat these peppers, and hopefully they will listen. These are going in my hot pepper basket over here. These are absolutely loaded down with fruit. It's incredible. Let's move past the hot pepper. These are those Italian pepperoncinis. We can see you're starting to produce little fruits. They're nice and wrinkled already. And then we have our black beauty bell peppers. Look at that. Oh my goodness, they're gorgeous. Such beautiful fruits, I mean, really. So these right here are our Midori Giant soya beans. My husband always teases me because I call them soya beans. He's like, they're soy beans. <laughs> I was like, well, technically, 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 they can be called either or. So, you know, it's, it's a personal choice, but he likes to tease me about that. These actually look like a lot of these are ready to harvest. I have not harvested the soybeans that I'm saving for seed down there. I'll get around to it when I get around to it. It's been a challenging couple of weeks, so I'm not going to worry about it too much. As you can see, it's definitely time to prune the cucumbers again. It's possibly a little past that time, if I'm being honest. As the garden goes on, it gets wilder and wilder and wilder, and I have more and more things to keep up on and things are just naturally going to start going a little haywire. So we do our best to stay on top of it in the early stages of the growing season. And we extend grace to ourselves when we're not able to keep up on everything as well as we'd like to. Because despite the fact that we are growing all of this food, family still comes first, church still comes first, and the garden comes second. And that's okay, and that's the way it's supposed to be. We harvest a lot of food, and I'm not gonna beat myself up over the fact that sometimes I don't get things done when I would like them to. But this is a lot of cucumbers. I haven't harvested this trellis in two days. Two, that's it. If your cucumbers are starting to look like this, they're turning yellow and you're like, what's going on with that cucumber? It's ripening, it's going to seed. It's not gonna be a very tasty cucumber when it starts to turn yellow, but if you scoop the seeds out, you can save them for next year and not have to buy seeds for that cucumber variety. So it's not a bad thing to let them ripen on the vine. But yeah, ripe cucumbers are actually yellow and orange. Okay, <laughs> how this cucumber is not orange is beyond me. Look at this. It's a Boston National Pickling Cucumber run amok. This is bigger than my hand. This is enormous. Oh my goodness. 
Look at that. All right, over here, there are some more cucumbers somehow. Mm-hmm. And I will grab the wheelbarrow in a little bit. Yay. As you can see, our giant southern curled mustard is still falling over and working on getting seeds done. This is kind of the watermelon <laughs> tomatillo bed. Tomatillos are fairly easy to tell when they are ripe because they will have filled out their little lanterns and the lanterns will often be starting to turn brown. Like this is a good example. You see how this tomatillo right here is starting to get this kind of brown paperiness to it. It's not a super big tomatillo, but it's starting to light, lighten in color a bit. This one's ripe, but you can also harvest tomatillos before they are fully ripe and then leave them in their lanterns on the counter and they'll ripen over the course of a few days, just like tomatoes. And I will often come through and pick the ones that have filled out the lanterns the most, whether or not they're dried out and do just that, like this. That's a really nice tomatillo and the bugs love them too. So here you can see our Coma Coma squash is starting to ripen at the bottom. It's really cute, it looks like a specialty type of small pumpkin. And then in through here, we have our red curry squash. This one's ready to go. Red curry squash is really productive. I've been really happy with this. This has been really good. It'll get a deeper red, but I can do that on the counter. Now these plants are definitely suffering from vine borer damage. I've seen quite a bit of it. I don't know how much longer they're gonna survive. I've made my peace with it. So you can see this is vine borer damage right there. You see that? It's just like a crater of a hole in the plant. And although there are blooms, we're not seeing any of their fruit because it's too hard on the plant to deal with a gaping hole. These right here are round zucchinis. And if we work our way down, we do have some more straight-necked yellow squash coming in. Ooh, there's some big ones in there. I love my chickens. I do, I love them. But sometimes, one right here, a huge, big, beautiful, giant butternut type of squash. And look at this. Hopefully this will scab over, because if not, that buff is on my short list. Which sounds more threatening than it is, because so I love her. Okay, this right here is a giant Indian snake bean. Look at how gorgeous these flowers are. They look just like Maypop flowers, except not purple. Look at those. Aren't those just the most gorgeous little blooms you've ever seen? And then right above me on this trellis, this is a volunteer pumpkin. I did not plant that. It's looking awesome and beautiful, so I'm letting it live there and have its happy place. This is a volunteer tomato. This has been kind of an experiment. So far, it's doing pretty good. Again, I'm just gonna leave it. Hakuna Matata. Now this pumpkin finally started producing fruit. Check this out. Look at this. How beautiful is this pumpkin right here? Then down here we have Romas that are coming in and then our Pink Fang tomatoes. These are doing great as well. More Black Beauties. These right here, these are sun golds. These are extremely sweet little cherry tomatoes. Love these. They're just large cherry tomatoes. Now over here you can see that the carrots, we harvested a bunch of carrot seeds. I have a video coming out on this in the near future. So we'll tell you all about how to harvest your carrot seeds. This magnificent beauty is the Kikuzi squash. That's Debbie right there. <laughs> this is the Kikuzi squash. We're getting lots of fruits on here. Really enjoying the Kikuzi squash. It's doing really good. All right, you guys, that'll wrap up the garden tour for today. I will see you later on in the week, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye, y'all.